your best defenses are in your constitution, that that constitution is a viable contract, that it is enforceable in the court of law under the statute of frauds, that you have a right to claim those rights, that the burden is on you to claim them timely, and a key word here is timely, or you lose the right. So you want to be uh, cognizant of your rights and be able to timely speak up, okay? Now, let's go on to a couple of things here. We're going to... <coughs> We're going to concentrate, as we did before, on our main basic cases. We also want to give you some further advanced programming. The book, The Federalist Papers, by Madison, Hamilton, and Jay. Those are the gentlemen that wrote the United States Constitution, okay? And you want the mentor edition because it is the unabridged edition. Now, the Supreme Court has ruled in the case of Cohen versus Virginia. That's recorded at 6, Wheat Reporter, Volume Volume 6, page 2, all right? Now, wheat is an old report, and, and this was done in 1821, so you may have to go to your leading law library around, like we go to Michigan, University of Michigan, or we go to Detroit College of Law, but <clears throat> you want to very... These pages will be so old, you'll have to worry how you turn them without trying to screw them up. But the Supreme Court ruled in the matter of Cohen versus Virginia, 6 Week 2, that this book, The Federalist Papers, was the exact record of the intent of the framers of the Constitution, Madison, Hamilton, and Jay. Those are the guys that wrote the Constitution. So obviously being able to read their published uh, thoughts as they were doing this Constitution is very, very uh, forceful in terms of uh, constitutional interpretation, and the intent of the lawmaker is the law. And it shall be liberally enforced in favor of you. You are the clearly intended and expressly designated beneficiary, got me? So <clears throat> everything you can do to enhance your position in terms of how your lawmakers thought when they framed this Constitution clearly makes your case even more stronger for the Constitution to be interpreted in favor of you. So we recommend you get a copy of this Federalist Papers. You read it cover to cover. You want the Mentor Edition because that's the unabridged edition. You'll find some of the other editions got some of the pages pulled out, okay? Now, we want to get into some of the cases. Basically, the second program that we have here is the advanced section. We are going to be covering procedures. We're going to be teaching you how to be your own counsel. We're going to be telling you some facts and issues on what to do, what happens when you get pulled over, uh, how do you exercise your rights in a timely fashion. <clears throat> We're going to be talking about some of the, the problems that are going on in America today. She is very, very knowledgeable. She researched the right to keep and bear arms of the people back to the 1700s in England. And she came to the honest belief after all of her research, and of course she would be following her research because she is a person of very acclaim in terms of her study. She researched it back to the 1700s and found out that, yep, our, our right to keep and bear arms is a positive right. It has come from serious law all the way back to the Magna Carta. <coughs> and... Uh, she published a book, and the book here is To Keep in Bare Arms. It's a rather extensive book. Okay. Uh, you might. It's not hard to get a hold of. It did take us about ten days of ordering it to get a hold of it. Uh, but it's a definitive study on the right to keep in bare arms that verifies the, the holdings that at your average uh, person... Uh, who's NRA oriented or who basically is constitutionally oriented is going to be happy to have, which is basically the right to keep and bear arms is a protected right that goes back with great legal scholarly study. Okay? <clears throat> so these are a couple things that you can use to help you defend. Okay? We need to understand that at the beginning of every one of these laws, there is an enabling clause that basically says how the law shall be brought into being. And there is an argument, there is an argument that says, <coughs> okay, that the law that is presently here today is based on some law in the past, okay? And almost on every one of these constitutions, all the way up through our history, through the Articles of Confederation, through the U.S. Constitution, through uh, various state constitutions, they'll have an enabling law in the beginning, and of course, the, the enabling law just allows them to bring their version of the Constitution of what rights are there today. That the rights that were had before are carried on, plus are further delineated by this Constitution. But at no time do they have a right to abridge the previous document. Now, going all the way back to the Magna Carta, 
You can see the decisions where it comes down. The Magna Carta, the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, the United States Constitution, the Virginia Acts of Concession, the Northwest Ordinance, the Northwest Territorial Government, the Northwest Territorial Division, Indiana, the Indiana-Michigan Territorial Division, the Enabling Acts, and that's what I'm, I'm trying to explain to you today, the Michigan or Organization in and uh, submitting alternatives, and the Michigan assent to a uh, condition of admission. And then the state of Michigan became a state in 1837. Now this is just from my area, so I'm trying to give you an example. There is, then we have a constitution of 1835, we have a constitution of 1850, we have a constitution of 1908, we have a constitution of 1963. Every time one of these constitutions comes by, the enabling acts in the beginning of it state that everything that was before guaranteed is brought forward. <clears throat> okay? So everything that is before is brought forward and carried forward, and if anything, it's supposed to be made stronger. Okay? It's never made weaker, it's made stronger or it's equal to. So all of the rights brought forward are carried all the way back from the Magna Carta as a line of succession. So this is how you historically review trends and where, what, and how it comes from and how. Uh, authorities are established in law. Okay? Now, <clears throat> the important thing to understand is that we are going to cover procedures. We are back to our normal procedure here. We have our court cases here. We are going to start giving you examples of court cases as we go, and we're going to show you how you can exercise rights. Now, one of the first cases that we are going to bring is basically the right to travel all right now there's a lot of people that are interested in this particular issue and license plates and driver's licenses and all this and you have a lot of uh, programming that's uh, that's uh, problematic from this and you have a lot of people that are <clears throat> looking to argue so we want to share some basic arguments with you we're going to claim a first amendment right to travel and we're going to claim also a Fifth Amendment. It's guaranteed under the Fifth Amendment of due process and equal protection under the law. All right? Now, <clears throat> we come down, we looked up in our state constitution, and this is uh, our constitution, and basically we have protected a right to travel. Okay? The freedom to travel is a fundamental right that should be unlimited by statutes, rules, or regulations which unreasonably burden or restrict movement. Okay? Now then, a law which substantially affects or penalizes the exercise of the right to travel may be justified only by a compelling state interest and must be tailored carefully to avoid unnecessary infringement on the right. Okay? Now, when we come down here we start reading some of these arguments, you'll notice these little letters here that say, Freedom to travel throughout the United States has long been recognized as a basic right under the federal constitution. See note 54. You see, everybody see this little note 54 here? Again, we're going to take this note 54. We're going to come down here. <clears throat> and the very first case that we have is Shapiro versus Thompson. This is recorded at, at uh, 394. That's volume 394, U.S., page 618. And I just happen to have a copy of the case here. And this is Shapiro versus Thompson. Okay, now the beginning of the case... All right, pull that one up there. The beginning of the case, they're talking about the purpose of inhibiting migration by needy persons into a state is constitutionally impermissible. All right? All citizens must be free to travel throughout the United States uninhibited by statutes, rules, or regulations, which unreasonably burden or restrict this movement, all right? If a law has no other purpose than to chill assertions of constitutional rights by penalizing those who choose to exercise them, it is patently unconstitutional. All right, does everybody pick up on the gist of the argument here? Equal Protection Clause prohibits... The Equal Protection Clause prohibits... Apportionment of state services according to part tax contributions of its citizens. Any classification which serves to penalize the exercise of a right of interstate travel unless shown to be necessary to promote a compelling government interest is unconstitutional. Okay? Now, that's clearly established. Now, we go into the case. <clears throat> we come to find out. It says that the right... The right finds no explicit mention in the Constitution. 
This is what I was trying to tell you. You've got to use a little bit of uh, wisdom.